Uh, hi all, uh, thanks for uh, joining the webinar. Uh, the webinar is about to begin. Due to the popularity of this session from last year, Build to Perform, the speaker have all dared to repeat it for the SIPSI Grow Your Knowledge series. Please note that uh, the webinar will be recorded and the slides will be shared through the SIPSI website and you're gonna receive an email. We will let our speakers go through their presentation and in the meantime, if you have any questions, please feel free to type them and at the end we will have a Q&A session. Without further ado, um, I would like to introduce myself and the presenters. Uh, my name is Konstantinos Taktadzis, I work for uh, GBE Services in London and I am a mechanical service engineer and I'm the vice chair of the Young Energy Performance Group, part of the SIPSI. Our first presenter will be Louise uh, Hammer. Uh, she's a global lead of uh, the life cycle research uh, at the Tegra Group, and uh, an interactive global network of over 800 design professionals collaborating under the single deep green engineering umbrella of which Elemental Consulting in London is part of it. Her role is to lead the development of Tegra Global and practice both at building, MEP le building and MEP levels. With a degree in architecture and engineering, she has a strong understanding and experience in re regenerative design, holistic thinking, as well as a whole life carbon and life cycle assessment. She has been strongly involved in the embodied carbon uh, primary publication from Letty. Recently, CPC Journal published her work on whole life of carbon. She has also been presenting uh, elemental work on embodied carbon of NEP system at series of events such as the CIPSI Build to Perform conference in France and the UK Architects Declare Embodied Carbon Seminars. Then we have uh, Steve uh, Wisby, who is a partner at Horley. Uh, he has uh, studied in environmental engineering and he still gets the AMA 3 hunger reaction. He has more than 35 years of experience within the industry, both in contracting and consulting. He joined Hurley in London office since 1991 and have been a partner with that firm since 2002. Uh, the most uh, rewarding project that he has worked on are those where clients really push to improve, the, improve upon environmental challenges and targets beyond just being code compliant. His approach on project starts with uh, simplification. The simpler the solution is, the desired outcome is more easier to achieve, control and maintain. Constantly drawn to solve and rationalize complex technical challenges and not afraid to offer objective op opinion on issues. Um, Last but not least, uh, Dave Persson. He's a director at Star Renewable Energy. Dave has worked in industrial cooling since 1996, first in compressor research and development for hardened compressors in his native uh, Glasgow, then for Star Refrigeration Limited. <clears throat> Early projects included ice rings, cold storage, high performance data centers, as well as process cooling for petrochemical facilities. In 2009, after a period of uh, food uh, freezer experts, Starfrost, Dave moved back to Star as a director of innovation. Within months, a path into renewable heating was plotted for the business and following several success, including Drum and Fer at the 90 degrees ammonia district heating plant, the business established a Star Renewable Energy to focus on clean heat. A former director of Scottish Renewable and current chair of Seed Scotland, a business-to-business -business knowledge sharing hub. Dave is current chair of the renewable heat and cooling platform as it drives forward a mission for 100% renewable heat cooling by 2050. When designing heat pump systems, uh, there are a um, few things that we have taken into consideration, such as the source. Is it gonna be air source heat pump, ground source heat pump, and etc. Temperatures are also crucial. Um, what we're looking to achieve and what temperatures are available on the external condition, for example, at the warmer, climate change, warmer climates, um, the COP would be increased since the weather is quite important. 
temperatures are also important as we have to determine what type of heating system, for example, radiators, would be more difficult as they run at higher temperatures. We also have to take into consideration the available space, not only for maintenance, but for air movement to mitigate the creation of microclimate conditions and correct functioning of heat pumps. When deciding the location of the heat pumps, we have to consider the acoustics, the impact on neighbors, and how we can mitigate noise issues. We also have to take into consideration the cost, not only the capital cost, but should consider the running cost. Having said that, as the grid is going greener through various renewable energies, such as wind, solar, and so on, the environmental, the environmental impact is reduced. And as we need to achieve net zero carbon by 2050, we have to design and act from now. So this presentation will focus on the whole life uh, carbon analysis, the technical consideration when when specify heat pump and large heat pump installations. I will pass it on to Louise. Uh, I can hear you quite well. Hello, can you hear us, Louise? Yes. Can everybody see my screen? Can... Uh, not quite, actually. Do I need to swap presenter? Uh, I have made your presenter. No, but do can you see full the full screen? screen slide mode and um, mm, oh you see my notes i see your notes yeah if you can swap it yeah that would be perfect yeah right hi everyone happy to be presenting to you all i hope everybody is uh, safe and going well. Um, I'm going to be talking about heat pumps and whole life carbon and more specifically about a study that we did where we tried to understand the importance of whole life carbon in the selection of heat generation equipment. And as Costa said, um, it's a presentation we already gave at Build to Perform last week, try to do some updates uh, with latest um, latest knowledge on this so these are kind of the key questions that we're going to be i'm going to be trying to answer through these um uh, this session um we all know you know there is a strong correlation between global warming and the amount of greenhouse uh, released in the air you know which we refer as carbon emissions because they are actually measured in co2 equivalent so an, eff an effective way uh, to make mitigate climate change is really about reducing our carbon emissions that is to say reducing both operational carbon and embodied carbon um, so operational meaning, you know, um, the energy used during the, the building lifetime was embodied, focused more on the materials aspect, you know, how, do, how is it made, how is it installed, uh, replaced, uh, maintained, and its end of life. Until now, we've, you know, we've been pretty good at reducing the operational carbon emissions and actually heat pumps are a big part of it as our grid are decarbonizing, but we also need to look at embodied carbon as well. So this is like more for like the whole building industry, but you know, how does this concern building services engineers? Um, so we had a look at, if you look at what the literature uh, says, um, we found out through the numerous case studies, it would be about building services would be about, you know, 11% of your building embodied carbon emissions. But when you dive in a bit deeper and try to look at the assumptions, you find that a lot of things have not been accounted. So at Integral Group, so 
Elementa is part of Integral Group, we decided to go uh, look at this a bit in a deeper way and trying to analyze for a, a whole building what would be the embodied carbon emissions associated with them. MEP really taking into account everything and you can find this study on SIPSI journal in December uh, edition and what we actually found out was that MEP could account for new build an office new build between you know 50% to 15% of your building carbon emissions and in a case of, of this retrofit uh, between 75% and 37% which uh, when you think about it, it's quite huge because it's just embodied carbon and then you know you have the operational on the sides. So it appears that both operational and embodied carbon needs to be considered in NEP design to truly mitigate carbon emissions. Um, another question we wanted asking then, okay, we need to look at both, but does this then change our approach on does it change our decisions in the way we design MEP? When we did the study, one thing that was actually quite striking is that in the worst, you know, um, impact scenario, uh, you could see that refrigerant leakage has a huge impact, about 18% of your total buildings embodied carbon emissions. You know, it's more than structures and walls and that kind of things. Um, and it really could be uh, reduced depending on the scenario used. So it really, um, you know, we we specify a lot of heat pumps because you know it's like high efficiency and because the grid is decarbonizing then the operational carbon emissions are so low but there's like we had to ask ourselves are we doing the right thing you know when we're specifying heat pumps and other refrigerant based products when you know you see that um, refrigerant uh, leakage can have such a huge impact so I'm going to present you a study that we did called Whole Life Carbon Study of Heat Generation Equipment uh, that was released in the SIPSI Technical Symposium 2019. So you can um, have a look uh, online. It's uh, available where we compared uh, four different uh, equipment, a gas boiler, CHP, heat pumps and VRF. Um, we tried to collect a lot of data. We followed, you know, calculation method established by, uh, you know, key institutions, um, and we build up some scenarios. We also gathered data from different database, and uh, we created a methodology to produce um, a high, medium, and low impact scenarios to kind of look at the different uh, impacts. And again, all this is detailed in the paper published online. And this is what we found out. For an existing building, you can see that you know boilers and CHP have much higher whole life carbon impact across the whole different you know scenarios. Um, and then for new builds, it stays the same. So you can see, you know, it's like so I, I kept the same scale. So um, the carbon impact are going down. But we also looked at passive house uh, type buildings, you know, where the demand is very low. And you can see that it becomes a bit trickier. You cannot see really well, but you see we are having a high impact scenario as a so seat pump might be bigger than a boiler and a CHP. So for this slide, I actually zoomed out. Zoomed in, sorry, and you can see that air source heat pump with you know using a high globing potential refrigerant of 2088, which is very common. It's typically a 410A. Uh, it can be higher than a gas boiler, and same for EVA F, but even bigger. And you can see the green part. It's mostly associated with a green, you know, dark green part, which is B1 in use refrigerant uh, leakage. Um, this was really important for us to find out because, you know, we thought we'd have tendency to think, oh, heat pumps are there are always the way to go. But as we design ultra low energy buildings, you know, with really good, with a low demand and really good fabric and passive design measures, we have to be careful more about these things. And just for, um, as a kind of a scenario, if we're to say globing or potential of refrigerant to be limited to 150 uh, for a passive house type building, you'll see things would get back to normal, if I could say, and you have so seat pumps and VRF could be much lower um, in terms of whole life carbon impact. So really conclusion is yes, specify heat pumps, yes, but you know, watch out really for refrigerants and really need to pull um, to 
have regulation becoming strong a bit more stronger in this because at the moment uh, the f gas regulation in europe is trying to um, mitigate the environmental impacts of refrigerants but it's really not enough and the 150 target doesn't apply to the building industry yet i mean it only applies to really big commercial um, supermarkets um, And also, just a small we just to tell, let you know that we're actually working on a refrigerant and impact impacts best practice guide at the moment, and it's something that we'd be going to be releasing like in the following months, so hopefully end of May or beginning of June, where we detail the type of refrigerant that exists, what you know you need to be aware, um, what you should be doing about refrigerant leakage and of recovery, and how you can you do design, um, you know. Um, product selection based on that. So it's something we're working on. Um, for the heat generation equipment, we're wondering what impacts most the embodied carbon emission. So through these studies, you know, so we remove here the operational energy and we remove anything related to refrigerant leakage um, and end of life. You can see that across Pretty across all the scenarios and all the different equipment, it's really material extraction and replacement that makes the biggest uh, you know chunk of your whole life carbon emissions um, so that was interesting for us because as you know it's really hard to get data but from the study we could sense that really what the product is made of and what's the product lifetime so meaning you know replacement rate over a building lifetime of the product would be really the key things to concentrate on at the beginning to try to reduce um, you know, the embodied carbon thing, impact. Um, also ask the question, what impacts, uh, you know, whole life carbon most, what should be considered in the, de and then, you know, what should be considered in the design of heat generation equipment? So I'm just going to try to summarize. It. Obviously, you know, this whole life carbon subject is really linked to, you know, the grid carbon factor you use and your decisions might really change on this. Um, so this is a graph where we plotted the different results according to the uh, grid carbon factors. And we used uh, something between you know, UK 2030 and UK 2018 for the study. Um, kind of a key takeaways, you know, biggest impact for whole life reduction measures is like looking at the refrigerant globing potential, you know, a lot more, um, Alternatives are really appearing on the market, uh, so let's let's look at them. Trying to make it mitigate refrigerant leakage rate. Again, we're going to be addressing this in our next publication. Use high thermal efficiencies. Those like things we've been you know tending to to do since the last decade on mitigating operational. It's still relevant, and we we'll still be doing that. And trying to reduce the emissions associated with extraction and processing of remote materials, which is also, by the way, really linked you know to the it's going to be linked to the weight of your product. So if you design for a lower percentile, like 95% percentile, um, you're going to have, you know, smaller equipment. So it means like less materials are extracted. So effectively, you're going to reduce your embodied carbon uh, emissions. Uh, what we found that was less uh, negligible, and I put the same slide, my, I'm sorry, but it was the transport was less negligible was more negligible and you know where it was coming from because of the really carbon intensive materials that were used in the thing and i tried to summarize in one slide you know what can engineers do design down equipments use loads reduce redistribution design to 95 percentile so it's like it's true for a bit all the MEP part. Think about refrigerant emissions when you're using refrigerant-based products in heat generation and try to specify equipments with you know low refrigerant coming potential leakage, high thermal efficiency, high reuse components, low weight materials with low embodied carbon. Uh, if you're interested to know a bit uh, more about this, so in the latte embodied carbon primer that was just released at the beginning of the year, there is a building services section where um, I worked on and as well as someone from SIPSI, Julie Gotfra. I would also strongly advise to 
We'll look again at the CIP CTM56 on resource efficiency of building services that gives good you know, overview principles of what to do and how to reduce uh, whole life carbon emissions, like basics, uh, basic things to do. And also, um, I've, um, there is a conference uh, accessible online on our website called IG Vision, where I talk about embodied carbon in MEP design that gives a bit broader overview and a little bit more data on where we are at. So these are potential useful resources if you want to know more. And that's it for me. Thank you. Um. I will pass now to um, Steve. Um, Steve, you are a presenter now, if you want to share your screen. Hi. Uh, can everyone hear? Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, we can hear you. Cool. Good, good, good. Yeah. Hi, good morning. Uh, yes, I'm going to take you through uh, a, a bit of a story about how we have been looking at uh, heat pumps for over a year now since the, the the uh, lowering of the emission uh, carbon content of the national grid. Um, and uh, this is basically a summary of a, an internal group that we set up uh, over a year ago now, looking at um, uh, how the design for heating, in particular the residential sector, was going to change. Um, so let me just take you uh, through. Um, can I click? Yep. So the, the the reason why everyone's so interested, I believe, in heat pumps is obvious uh, with regards to the, the drive of the UK government through the Climate Change Act to decarbonise the um, UK, in particular the electricity grid. Um, and there is a vast um, amount of money going into an offshore wind, and wind is going to be far more uh, prevalent in the eastern and western coasts of the UK. Um, to help um, assist the uh, decarbonisation as well as nuclear. Um, we've already had, I think, one day last year where in fact, we had um, almost 100% uh, renewables supplying the country. Um, I expect we'll do the same this year, uh, particularly in lockdown. Um, we've also got the driver of the um, GLA um, with regards to its London plan which is still out for, um, it still hasn't been published in full, but it uh, looked at saying any planning permissions um, that actually get referred back to the GLA should do its energy analysis using um, SAP 10 figures, which at the time of this presentation last year was um, recently changed from 0.223 and it's now down at 0.136 because of the ever decreasing carbon content of the national grid and renewables that are coming online. Um, building regulations, again in Part L, should be changing. Uh, it's still due to be published at the end of this year, um, but um, we'll see what impact the um, COVID lockdown uh, is having on timescales of that. Uh, there's nothing formally been announced on the building regulations, but it is um, expected that the carbon content electricity be severely reduced. Um, below that of gas, hence why um, a lot of the heating is switching from gas to um, electricity. And also, uh, um, late last year, the government announced that any new homes should be uh, without gas, um, including cooking, which um, I'm sure some of the ladies and the um, gentlemen here who do fancy cooking um, uh, maybe I'll prefer gas, so it's going to become more difficult to get gas into in times. One of the other drivers is obviously air quality as well, particularly in um, the built-up areas um, where gas uh, burning in fossil fuels is actually creating more of an issue with uh, air quality. Obviously changing to electric form of heating only is, is going to aid that, albeit that pollution gets pushed to the generation if there's uh, gas more gas on the uh, the network for um, power stations. So to take you through um, what we found the headline issues um, with regards to the um, way th 
design impact uh, on uh, the switching from gas to electric. And, and the obvious one is that of um, the electrical infrastructure, um, because you are effectively not having any gas or, um, into your building to provide heating, the uh, electrical load on the building can be significant and a significant increase uh, beyond that of the local network operators. So you have to have early discussions on capacity um, because some of that capacity cost, if you want to do an all electric solution, whether it be uh, direct or part direct and part uh, heat pump, may impose um, quite a large sum on the infrastructure network to actually get that power supply into the building. Um, controls um, on the electrical side may also be um, a thing that uh, will come in uh, where it's demand and demand controlled. Um, particularly if you are looking at um, part top up through electric immersion, um, and I'll come on to that later, but basically the, the the switching in of electric immersion to do hot water generation and over and above the uh, generation that's done through heat pump may actually be uh, time strapped um, in regards to the cost of when that kicks in but also how it's um, demand side adjusted to make sure you don't go over the peak capacity of the incoming supply if diversity has been taken into account. So that's, that's one, of, one of the key issues is looking at how you control electrical usage in the building when you are um, providing everything through electrical uh, for heating, electricity, sorry. Um, and the profiles, uh, it, it's sort of a no brainer, but the, in domestic and residential environments, you're looking at early morning and evening peaks. Um, and that evening peak is probably going to be the most expensive with regards to electrical generation. Um, so there may be an issue where um, demand side um, locking and controls looks at the cost of electricity and you may be penalized for using um, electric electricity at that time. So storage may well be uh, coming into the discussion far more with regards to electricity costing. So there will be possibly variable tariffs through through the day in, in the near future. With air source heat pumps in particular, um, we're, we're now um, having discussions rather than just chillers, but also the heat source that used to be in the basement um, with flues going up through the roof. We're now looking at um, basically uh, likes of chillers on roof. Um, and that's impacting on the roofscape because we're finding that most residential developments have the pressure of amenity space and there's a lot of greening of roofs so there's um, a great discussion with the architect for the early doors regards to roof space allocation and alongside that goes noise uh, because the uh, additional um, condenser, sorry, the evaporator fans on the heat pumps generate um, noise that needs to be controlled, particularly in residential, and how that immunity space can work alongside uh, plant space. There's also, um, depending on the design of, of hot water, whether you include hot water storage in your uh, distribution when heat pumps are used, um, looking at the utility cupboard inside the apartments, uh, that may need to grow to in include um, hot water storage and we're finding that there's a lot of discussion about energy loop solution where you provide a sort of ambient loop throughout the building and look at the um, heat, gen heat pump generation but placing in the apartments um, and I'll come on to the pros and cons of that a bit later but using that energy loop will actually aid the uh, heat gain that the corridors and rises see um, currently on elevated temperatures where overheating um, in, in many places occurs. Um, something that I'm not, I, th I think Dave will also cover what, um, a bit later, but also the, the issue we found with regards to heat pumps is obviously the temperature limitations and what happens when you start asking for high distribution temperatures in regards to the COPs 
and there you can see the difference between air and um, ground source with regards to the COPs in the top right hand graph um, and the um, heat pump, the heat pumps do not like a very large delta T across them so the, the primary if you do primary circulation that is on a high volume flow rate um, and obviously to get pipe sizes down you need to look at your secondary distribution whether you actually do that on a high higher delta which is normally the case so you do end up with a high primary flow rate and a decoupling of secondary um, so that you need to take that into consideration um, and obviously you do have uh, COP deficiencies when you start going uh, up in temperature um, but also at uh, very low ambient temperatures um, where you start going into you know, where you actually need the heat most the COPs downgrade so you do lose the benefit of the heat pump um, on air source that is um, hot water generation is is the key um, I know there's been some questions on that already um, but with uh, it has to meet HSE guidance there's no way of getting around that um, to achieve 50 degrees C in the outlet and have the storage if there's storage uh, raising up to 60 degrees C for an hour and obviously the other issue is the um, with reduced flow and return temperatures your in-space emitters uh, start increasing in size but obviously a lot of heat pumps are associated with unfloor heating which only takes 45 generally 45 degrees which is a good heat pump match um, but it is very expensive as a form of um, heating an apartment cost in use um, is, is the main issue that um, we're seeing as being the uh, end user perception which when you start talking about a, a, a another box of tricks um, within the apartment if it is a apartment units rather than gas boiler you end up with um, having to keep controls in particular as simple as possible um, and to make the um, fault diagnostics I'd say that, um, as simple as possible as well maintenance space within the utility cupboard and around heat pumps is something that um, needs to be considered um, and also on maintenance contracts and I'll come on to the, the issues with dispersed heat pumps within residential units rather than uh, sticking with central because um, we are seeing that um, with the energy loop solution that you end up with in apartment heat pumps but and uh, we need to then agree how you know, heat pumps are maintained whether it's by the tenant or whether it's on a, a group collective in regards to a tenancy um, uh, uh, sorry an apartment ownership of the block as to how to set up maintenance contracts and there's also coming in with the future home standard which is linked to part l um, a introduction of affordability standard um, there's no details on that yet as to what the limits will be um, but i can tell you now that even on my property that i i live in the cost ratio between gas and electricity is currently 4.4 so uh, for each kilowatt of gas i use um, it is going to cost me more to use electricity um, per kilowatt um, um, if I uh, venture down the, the heat pump route. <coughs> Acoustics, uh, I've mentioned before, um, not just externally, obviously with um, um, airborne noise to uh, adjacent residences or, or amenity space, but in particular, um, if you go for in apartment heat pumps, um, that the actual heat pump itself is acoustically treated and the utility cupboard is uh, well designed with regards to its enclosure because these heat pumps um, will probably generate electricity, sorry, uh, generate hot water at night uh, and siting that utility cupboard in its correct location away from bedrooms um, that can become extremely problematic if you start including um, heat pumps in um, the very quiet spaces of a, as a residence. Um, Louise has mentioned about um, DWP on the, um, on the gases, but 
they they are changing with regards to heat pumps. Um, there's a lot uh, going on with regards to R32 at the moment, um, and also some types of heat pumps that will uh, generate hot water only. Um, sorry, heat, hot water storage and use only, rather than just heating lower temperature. Um, and that may well be applicable for spaces where you have a, actually have got a high hot water demand. And we are still uh, doing the phase down, sorry, of the um, current refrigerants. The, um, we've got our 513A and 11234ZE uh, coming in. Um, but they're not particularly widespread at the moment, but uh, I can see those coming along to lower the uh, GWP. If you go on to uh, solutions, um, we've seen two, two trends here. One, one is um, actually replacing boilers with heat pumps, and obviously with air source heat pumps that the plant equipment goes up on the roof. You resupply to heat interface units, um, but you look at the um, provision of uh, hot water storage inside the apartments, primarily because the uh, to keep the um, temperature that's generated by the heat pumps to a lower temperature rather than 80 or 70 degrees C because of the COP degradation. So we are seeing that um, we're circulating at 55 up to 57 degrees C, um, primarily to get uh, the benefit of um, the efficiency out of the heat pump, albeit they are still pretty high for heat pumps, air source heat pumps. And then doing hot water storage with possible of electric top up um, to basically use the heat interface unit to preheat on the uh, domestic hot water storage. We also have um, impacts of defrost cycles where that central air source generation needs to have some buffer in there or multiple units to allow cycling of units to defrost at low ambience. Um, we obviously have the um, noise impact, uh, which is coming back to about central solutions. Um, and then you've got the resilience discussion about uh, how many of those external units do you have um, as to having units offline or in defrost. And then there's obviously the operational cost uh, because of electric top up. So the, the alternative solution that's um, a, lot, a lot of uh, clients are seeing um, requesting this is reviewed in, in some detail and that's looking at energy loop where you circulate to lower temperature grade water, you put air source heat pumps, sorry, uh, uh, water source heat pumps to elevate uh, temperatures into the space that will do hot water generation and um, uh, space heating on lower temperatures. Again, in most res residentials, that space heating is actually very low in demand, and it's all looking at hot water generation. You still have issues with um, electrical infrastructure, um, but you then have the options for uh, the calculations on diversity, um, probably more so than the electrical top-up, because the electrical top-up um, on apartments on the previous uh, slide was uh, probably less in diversity than, than this arrangement. Um, so I'm, I'm uh, nearly there. So we are seeing certain solutions with, with heat pumps come through. One that's combined with um, looking at heat recovery units, uh, saying, can you actually heat an apartment um, and possibly do some hot water generation, albeit with electric top up, where you actually reclaim heat off your um, MVHR. Um, uh, but my experience on MVHRs are that um, most tenants switch them off. <laughs> it's very sad case for affairs, but there's a lot of education still to go on with tenancies with regards to MVHRs and how important they are for uh, air quality and health within uh, residential units. Um, but we are seeing that there's some uh, benefit of this if you have got a very low uh, hot water demand and um, are prepared to wait a long time for heat generation, so hot water generation, and they are a, a viable solution, but uh, there are limits on that. 
And then there's also the issue um, of uh, hot water storage with heat pumps integral to it, which is on the right hand side there. Um, a lot more compact, um, um, but they are um, looking at a uh, packaged unit. And the, the elephant in the room is um, direct electric, because everyone will argue that um, if your electricity carbon content is so low, why aren't you using um, direct electric? And it, it can still pass Partel currently, um, and the current guise of Partel, if your carbon content is, is used. Um, but you have to improve the hot water storage and distribution, the fabric performance to do it. The energy costs are, are going to be higher because it's direct direct use, um, but you do actually reduce service charge, so it becomes a lot simpler installation and, and maintenance using direct electric. Um, but in the scheme of things, it's not the best way to go with regards to carbon emissions, um, even though the carbon content electricity is decreasing, um, it's not the way to get to uh, effectively to net zero. There's developers like this a lot, as you say, because the um, the installation cost is extremely low uh, compared to uh, doing a wet system. The key to everything here, though, is controls, how people can control the, their, their devices and heat pumps or uh, direct electric. Um, but we are seeing kickback within um, uh, GLA. GLA will not allow direct electric in any of their planning approval process. And we expect this to be adopted by the uh, and local authorities too. So thank you. Sorry for that. But I'll pass over now to Costas uh, and for David. Can you hear me? Yes, can Costas. Okay, right, thanks. Um, so some really interesting stuff uh, so far. Um, I'm going to take a slightly different perspective on it with regard to the, the retrofit side of things, but uh, I'll crack on because we've not got very much time. Um, let me just get this going. Okay, so very briefly background to Star. We're actually an industrial cooling company doing uh, large cooling facilities up and down the country. Um, so there's this core business, but the heat pump bit came about uh, around about 12 years ago. Um, this has been covered, but in case anybody's not, not got it, a heat pump is just a device that cools one thing down and heats something else up. It could be air or it could be water from a river, ground source, uh, lots of different sources. The heat pump bit in the middle uh, is, is the variable bit. And what I'm going to hopefully take you through today is what makes the difference between an average heat pump and a good heat pump. They're all governed by, by the physics, as Scotty in Star Trek said, you can't change the laws of physics, and maybe he sounds a wee bit like me, but it's this is the pH diagram, and basically the amount of heat out we get is line number two across the top, um, sorry, and the, the amount of electricity we put in is line number one, and, and two minus one should equal four. I know that's funny maths, but the amount of heat that we're taking in from the, the water or the air is across the bottom. So how do we make them better? And the short answer is, to deliver heat at a lower temperature whilst harvesting at higher temperature to give us less requirement for electricity. Now that's that's a function of the actual operation of the heat pump. The other factor is the design of the compressor uh, and also the, the working fluid that we're pumping around, they've all got different um, capabilities. So that's that's kind of the, the essence of it. Um, I think what, what's important to talk about heat pumps and where to deploy them, I know we've got a very diverse audience, I think there's about a thousand uh, here today, but the bit, the bit that we always need to be thinking about is when we're talking about heat pumps is to be very clear about which segment you're talking about. So the right way to do a new domestic property is different from um, an existing domestic property, say a, a suburban house, which is very different from industry. It's also very different from existing urban. And the existing urban is a bit that we really get into most. So we're tending to need higher temperatures. We're tending to need much, much bigger solutions. So back to uh, the river source heat pump, and that's largely what we've been doing in the country. And we, we've supported Vital Energy and Western Barter Council uh, to deploy uh, the UK's largest uh, high temperature water source heat pumps in, in Clydeback. And they're, they're about um, 80 degrees delivery temperature, but also um, about over five megawatts. We've also done a large air source heat pump. This is uh, for Glasgow Housing Association in Glasgow. 
and it's doing about 400 kilowatts, you can see very clearly that the, the capability, the COSP or the coefficient of system performance varies. So if it's 20 degree air, uh, ambient air temperature in Glasgow, frankly, uh, you're probably not in Glasgow if it's 20 degrees, but the efficiency will be 3.3. If it's minus 10, which equally probably isn't Glasgow, it's about 1.9. Glasgow tends to range between zero and 10. And so you can see the efficiency varies, the capacity varies as well, incidentally. So one of the downsides of air source is that the days that you want the most heat is the days when you, you have to work hardest to get it. Um, what we're doing uh, from, from the river source heat pump really stems from work we did back in 2010 in Norway. Uh, we delivered 90 degrees uh, with an efficiency of three. So that's from a fjord delivering heat at 90 degrees to district heating. And just to put that in context, I'm going to jump back to the previous screen and see that uh, this is for a heat pump, air source heat pump doing 60 degrees uh, using an HFC, a hydrofluorocarbon, cousin of CFCs. It's got the efficiency of something uh, around about uh, a 15 degree air temperature day, uh, delivering heat at only 60 degrees. What we did in Norway, because it's a much larger system using ammonia as a working fluid, uh, we're getting much, much higher efficiencies. Heat pumps are very honest devices. They take an electricity and they give you heat, and the operators really just want the maximum uh, ratio. So pretty chunky, as you can see from this. It's quite hard to get a good photo because it's hard to stand far enough back. We were so focused on the efficiency, we even harvest the, the waste heat from the electric motors, which is typically around about uh, 3 to 4 percent, so uh, definitely not to be sniffed at. Um, so Queen's Key, it's, uh, it's down the uh, River Clyde and Clyde Bank. It's the former John Brown shipyard down here, and there it has been cleared. It's a fairly iconic uh, crane there, and some existing buildings adjacent that we're going to have to heat, but also this whole new area as well. And there's an artist impression. It actually is pretty much looking like that now. We're nearly nearly getting to it. There it is right next to the river. Um, did a calculation recently. There's 200 megawatts of available heat from the river based on the flow rate of the river. And of course, this is the tidal part of the river. So really, the tide is washing in from the Irish Sea and the Firth of Clyde. Um, it's, it's not a, a, a totally inappropriate to say it's an infinite capacity of heat, certainly in the context of how much you might need 200 megawatts would be a lot for any any city. Um, the temperature does vary, not terribly much, maybe from about four degrees up to about 17, and again, not terribly often uh, up there, but the average temperature are about 10. So certainly not as warm as the air, but it's very, very consistent. And it's easy to harvest. Um, so we've got a pumping station next to the river and the energy center uh, over here. One of the ways that we do it in particular is not to have a break loop. The challenge with working with the rivers is they really aren't terribly clean, and putting a brake loop just exacerbates the problem. What we actually do is have uh, a loop where we get rid of the brake loop, and we take the river water direct into the heat pump. And so we don't use uh, plate heat exchangers as that uh, primary point of contact between the river and the, the heat pump. We use tubular heat exchangers that you can you can uh, clean. So there you see them there, the horizontal vessels take the river water directly in through them and out, and there's little brushes inside these tubes that can be uh, pushed upwards or downwards uh, by reversing the flow of water, and that gives us the, the cleaning capability. Um, the interesting bit, and this is really the main part of today, is uh, just keep checking time, is, is the warm end of the heat pump and how, how we improve the efficiency of this. Why do we go so, to so much bother to make this look so complicated? Uh, because a simplistic diagram has an evaporator, and a condenser, a compressor, and an expansion valve. There's only four components in the heat pump, and yet this looks really much more complicated than that. And the reason that we're doing this is to try and get extra performance. So one of the heat exchangers is the oil cooler. So we're harvesting all the heat from the oil system back into the district heating. And this heat exchanger over here is a subcooler, and that basically means that we can we can harvest heat from the, the condensed ammonia uh, even further if our district heating return temperature. And what I'll come on to is why that occurs. So de-superheater as well is also, uh, it's, we, it's, the heat has to come out somewhere, but in this particular piece, it comes out much, much warmer than the, the condensing temperature. So line number two is, is, is what sets the electrical efficiency. We can gather heat in different places at a higher grade than that and mix them back in. I'll skip forward just a little bit because I'm very conscious of time. Um, so very, very approximate outcome. As the river is warmer, you see a far higher efficiency. When the river is cooler, it's it's lower. Um, 
e equally, uh, depending on the delivery temperature, you know, if we want heat at 80 degrees from district heating, the performance is going to be worse than if we want heat at 60 degrees. So it's about designing the system to run best. And frankly, uh, one of the techniques that's really well deployed in Norway is this ability to flex the, the temperature. The heat network does not have to be at its design temperature every day of the year. Um, so they're, they're varying from around about 95 degrees down to about 75 degrees over the course of a heating season. They need some heat every day of the year because they're producing the hot water, but it's about flexing that. So here you see the, the complexity simplified a little bit in a line diagram, but basically we're taking the district heating water back in um, to the subcooler, then the condenser, then the oil cooler, then the desuperheater. And these two are the ones where we can get heat at about 95 degrees. And so the condenser could maybe be about 78 degrees and we blend this heat back in to get an average temperature of, of 80, if that's the case. Uh, the subcooler is an interesting one because the cooler the water comes back from district heating, the more subcooling you can do. And that varies by about half a percent per, per degree that the, the delta is wider. So uh, district heating, let's say 8060, will have an efficiency, but 8050 will be 10 Kelvin times half a percent better. So 5% better just by managing the district heating temperature. And that's where um, optimization of district heating is really, really critical. Equally, um, changing from 80 to 75 and lowering the condensing temperature affects the performance by about 1.5% per Kelvin. So changing from 80, 60 to 75, 45, for example, would, would give you probably well over 25% uh, improvement in the performance. So I put this cheeky slide in just to just to liven things up a wee bit and say, you know, why are we doing this? It's not just about um, re renewable energy. You know, we're, we're seeing at the moment this massive um, inclination to try and create green jobs and try and create livable cities. It occurred to me that the air quality above Glasgow hasn't been as good for a thousand years. And that will be the same across the cities in the UK. So I think the public are generally going to want to try and hang on to clean air as best they can. Um, heating is a big function of that. Whether we're burning gas or biomass or any other form of combustion, it creates NOx emissions into the city. And that that's really an increasingly significant part of what we're doing. So what we see with heat pumps, uh, A is about how to use them best, but it's about what flavor of ice cream are you wanting? And frankly, we should want them all, uh, whether it's um, on the right hand where smart grids, which is essentially saying run heat pumps dynamically to, to um, help influence the performance of the grid by buying more electricity when there's more electricity in the grid and buying less electricity, unloading, um, is essentially turning the heat network into a thermal battery is really critical in how we, how we work this. The price of electricity varies from negative at certain times of, of the day and year in the UK to uh, way higher than what you would consider to be rational, or way, way up to you know, 75 pence per kilowatt hour. The electricity companies are smoothing this out, but if you choose to, to buy a flexible tariff, you can make massive uh, differences on this. And so why is it, why is it so difficult? Um, really, uh, we've got this challenge of cheap gas, we've got the challenge of planning hurdles, we've got non-domestic rates, which put 50% uh, onto the cost of the heat from heat pumps and district heating. And, and frankly, as, as silly or stupid as it sounds, we don't have an obligation for buildings to do something better than the status quo. So we're really not uh, looking at the problem and addressing the problem. We're trying to influence other things to come in without you know, take, taking the, the stuff off the table. It's a bit like East, Easter Sunday morning where the kids have got their chocolate spread all over the table and then we're trying to get them to eat their cereal. If you don't take the, the goodies off the table, the thing that everybody's comfortable with and wants, you're not going to get this uptake of, of the other stuff. So I'll leave it at that, other than to say we created a little video to try and explain the vision that we have, but it's basically district heating for cities, uh, heat pumps on barges on the rivers and around the coast, but direct, directly coupled to offshore wind. Directly coupled would mean the electricity was typically around about 4.5 pence per kilowatt hour, heat pump efficiency of three, We'd be making heat at this point of around about 1.5 pence, plus, of course, the capital and deployment cost. But that gives us a fighting chance against gas. The, the deployment costs probably come to uh, at least double that again. But we might be seeing heat available for district heating delivered at something like four and a half pence. And that gives us a fighting chance. I think uh, there's some interesting stuff going on around hydrogen. But if you take uh, a, a unit of electricity at uh, four and a half pence and make half a unit of uh, hydrogen, uh, then effectively it's nine pence for a kilowatt hour of hydrogen uh, delivered. So that's really not very comparable in terms of the cost. So I'll leave it at that because I think there's probably some time for some questions uh, if, if we go back to 
the panel. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks, Dave. Um, I'll just uh, share my screen here. Just one second. Thank you all um, for um, this amazing uh, presentations and uh, obviously um, the takeaways uh, we can take from this one. Um, it's um, a from your electrical uh, uh, infrastructure that uh, is needed. Uh, be mindful of um, the user experience and the control strategy for life carbon and uh, operation carbon tailor made to decisions. Whole life carbon is affected by materials refrigeration chosen, optimize the COP of the units and consider the recooling. Right, we come to the Q and A. Um, the first one for um, Louise. Um, the refrigerant leakage scenario feels out of date. Refrigerant is not a consumable and is very carefully managed these days with design to sweet. What does that fit into the leakage model in the comparison? Um, hi. Um, so refrigerant leakage was a, you know, a tough nut because it's actually pretty hard to get um, measured data. Uh, we tried to gather as much um, reports you know documentations we could find i think we had about 10 different sources and we also asked manufacturers what uh, were the different uh, leakage rates and i think we just made an average uh, so effectively we were looking at you know for heat pumps a low impact scenario it was one percent annual leakage rate medium scenario it was 3.8 and for high impact it was six percent and for vrf it was between one percent and ten percent so one percent is still you know pretty low and that's where you might be thinking where we're at but um that being said if you have any data concerning this um especially actual measure data please do send them over that will be very useful thank you very much uh, another one, how did you calculate the refriger refrigerant leakage? Is it due to fault or during normal operation? Uh, so it's really linked to, it's not so um, it's not the impact associated of making the product. It's really the impact on when it's released into the air through, you know, in-use leakage and at end of life, uh, if it's recovered or not and what it becomes. Um, and it can really occur it's just it's a question of maintenance um of course if the product is sealed you know if the refrigerant is sealed in the products the leakage is going to be you know less probable it's more relevant for vf where you can have high distribution you know length um so it's really linked to you know maintenance and um just the the systems and the valves are you know getting old and they just leak. Perfect. A question to Steve. Um, with domestic resi applications, there will be potential loss of heating cooling within the apartments when the heat pump switches to top up for domestic hot water service cylinders. Has this been considered and how can this be avoided? Uh, well, it does vary depending on the type of uh, system. If you went to a plate heat exchanger, um, um, this really wouldn't apply, but the, the question I think is related to an in apartment unit where it most of them will not allow simultaneous heating and cooling, you have to have either. Uh, but if it's new residential, um, the cooling can sometimes be provided with um, hot water generation, but this depends on the type of unit. But yes, a hot water generation always takes priority and normally cuts out heating or cooling. Um, so the way hot water is managed 
Uh, as I say, the way people understand controls is going to be key, um, particularly if you're using it um, for uh, direct electric top up. Okay, thank you. Um, I have another one here. Um, do you think that changes in part L in section C moving towards electric heating heat pumps are risking affordability for the resident when the pumps are operating at low COP, at low outdoor temperature? Yeah, uh, for individual is yes, um, it may well become an issue um, unless the thermal properties of new prop, uh, new developments are severely reduced, uh, sorry, increased, so that we actually reduce the heat loss. Um, but that isn't the current indication in the Partel. Uh, the heat losses are still relatively high, um, and yes, the, my, my Biggest bugbear with heat pumps primarily is when you need them the most, they're at the worst efficiency. Um, and you, you'll get um, a, a new manner of operation, I think, with heat pumps um, as to how uh, much benefit there is um, in regards to feeling comfort um, and operating at uh, higher temperatures. Um, so the issue is for me, underfloor heating and providing some thermal mass is probably the best scenario for heat pumps so you don't actually end up with um, a sudden loss in performance and it's embedded over time with lots of thermal mass i think uh, i would add, add to that um yeah. there are obviously different ways of doing it and what i did in my house which wasn't the topic i was talking on i put a ground source heat pump in because i don't have that drop off in performance during the winter Equally, nighttime versus daytime, I can draw heat whenever I want. So I'll draw heat when electricity is cheapest for that. Now, my house isn't terribly well insulated. It's not terribly modern, um, but I've got a 13 kilowatt heat pump with a borehole in the front driveway delivering heat that, if I need it, up to 55 degrees for the radiators because I don't have underfloor heating. So I think the whole the whole scene is emerging quite, quite uh, well in all this. Um, obviously, for cities and, and larger buildings and air source, uh, there's, there's a bit of a trend in that. My nervousness is that people aren't modelling the cold air from the large air source heat pumps, um, which Correct. clearly yep. has to be accounted for. Yeah, there's a huge trend towards air source at the moment rather than ground source because of the, uh, the cost per dwelling. Um, I have uh, one for you, Dave. Um, is there a freezer and leakage based on split system or system where the freezer and gas is are hermetically sealed and less likely to leak? Oh, that, that sounds more like what Louise was talking about. Um, so maybe she should answer that one. All right. Sorry about that. Uh, Louise? Oh, sorry. Can you say that again? Uh, yeah. Uh, it, is there a refrigerant leakage based on split system or systems where the refrigerant gases are hermetically sealed and less likely to leak? Yeah, it's, so, I mean, indeed, when it's sealed, it's less likely to leak, but uh, it's more what, than what happens at the end of life, you know, is the process of, you know, taking out the refrigerant when the the product is ending its life what happens that's where some impact can happen in split systems for a vi for instance there might be bigger leakage indeed okay. but there's still a chance in both <laughs> to leak yeah yeah uh, we have a lot more questions that uh, we could have uh, gone for hours and hours but uh, unfortunately we don't have uh, a lot um, time left may i just ask uh, add something. I just seen a question mm -hmm. about EPDs, which are environmental product declarations. You know, it's like mm -hmm. um, nutritional um, nutritional food labels. You know, where like you can see all the calories or all the ingredients. So it's the equivalent, but within the building industry for different products. And there's a really uh, a problem and lack of data of EPDs concerning MEP design. And I just wanted to let you know that um, we are working with SIPSI to um, Kind of bridge that gap and working on a calculation methodology report that's gonna you know make um some assumptions or some embodied carbon calculations easier in the mep design and this should be released soon so um yeah hopefully that's useful yeah okay 
Right. Uh, I would like to uh, thank all the presenters uh, for the interesting talk and uh, everyone who joined this webinar. Uh, we have come to the end of this webinar and uh, hopefully the presentation was uh, beneficial to everyone. Thank you.